Ralph Pierce, a.k.a. Robert W. Simons, and P.R. Simmons, was born in Oxford, Ohio in 1903. A high school dropout, in 1920, at age 17, he lived with an uncle in Chicago. He was married to the former Dorothy Lind. The union lasted over 30 years. The Calumet newspapers claimed that Pierce was Jewish, but that doesn't appear to be true. Pierce joined the Capone organization in 1924 and was assigned to be Murray Humphreys' bodyguard, and in about 1925, Humphreys put him in charge of running all vice operations south of Roosevelt Road. His first arrest came in 1926. He was also questioned in the murder of Jake Lingle. In 1928, he was indicted for murder, election interference, and kidnapping. Pierce was arrested in connection to a 1929 kidnapping, but the charges were dropped without reason. In 1930, police raided Pierce's suite at the Paxton Hotel at 1430 North LaSalle Street and found 2.38 pistols. Seconds later, Murray Humphreys walked into the suite, was searched, and found to be carrying a pistol. Both were arrested. In court, Pierce argued, successfully, that his hotel room was his home and that he had a constitutional right to protect his home with his pistols. The judge agreed, and he was released. In 1931, he and Humphreys were arrested for attempting to bribe two Chicago policemen with $1,000 each. In 1933, he was seen in Indiana, near the place where Teddy Newberry was killed, on the night Newberry was killed. In 1935, he was arrested as the probable killer of motion pictures operators union boss Tommy Malloy and as one of the murderers in the gruesome killing of Estelle Carey in 1943. In both cases, the charges were dropped due to a lack of evidence. Pierce was arrested in 1945 for questioning in connection with the murder of James Red Forsyth, a longtime underworld hoodlum. In the late 1940s, he was a co-investor with Sam Golfbag Hunt in a series of floating casinos across the South Side. Pierce was technically employed by Laborers Local 714, although he was the virtual boss over the South Side rackets in the 1950s, meaning he earned millions of dollars each year. Pierce was indicted in the Bioff movie scandal in the 1940s, although he was later acquitted of all charges brought against him. In a career that spanned five decades, he was never convicted of a crime. Pierce's younger brother Frank ran a casino in the Tally Ho Tavern at 3000 East 138th Street in Burnham. His other siblings were Frederick 1906 to 1957, a sister, Francis Pierce, and several more from his father's second marriage. In the 1950s, Pierce owned the Silver Bar at 400 South LaSalle Street and was partners with Tony Accardo and Lester Kane in the notorious Owl Club in Calumet. He kept close contact with John Darko and Pat Marcy, the first ward fixers with the ability to influence the outcome of murder cases for the right price, and was well-liked by Sam Giancana when Giancana was boss. At the heyday of the outfit's involvement in Las Vegas, through his connection with his direct boss, Murray Humphreys, Pierce was known as the man to see four comps by hoods traveling to Vegas on vacation. Pierce, who lived part-time in Hot Springs, arranged for Jimmy Hoffa to hire an Arkansas state senator as his attorney. The state senator knew the judge in Hoffa's trial. In 1961, Annie Madden traveled to Chicago from Hot Springs to meet with Pierce, his longtime golfing partner, for help in repelling an invasion of New Orleans racketeers who were eating away at Madden's gambling base. When Humphreys died, Pierce took control of what had been a large gambling operation. The gray-haired dapper Ralph Pierce enjoyed giving the appearance of being a distinguished businessman. He was described as glib, but was friends with innumerable politicians and police officials. Over the years, he doled out hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash donations among the prominent political candidates in the 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th wards on the southeast side of Chicago. Elected officials had to go to Jenny's Restaurant at 91st and Stony Island Avenue, Pierce's Hangout, to pick up their cash. He was still considered a gambling power in 1967. However, by the late 1960, no longer immune from publicity or prosecution, the federal government and the media started to edge in on Pierce. Grand juries called him more and more. Local newspapers did large feature stories on him. The FBI randomly stopped him and announced to Pierce that it was time for your tune-up and held him for questioning. It was the FBI that informed police that Pierce was driving on an expired driver's license. He was fined $25. Perhaps as a means of self-protection and to get the FBI to ease up, in 1966, Pierce allowed himself to be recruited and handled by FBI agent William Romer. His cooperation lasted until his death. Pierce's cooperation was a godsend to the feds. 
After the Justice Department forced the FBI to discontinue its electronic surveillance program, the Bureau began to recruit mob informants with great urgency in the mid-1960s. Romer groomed Pierce through rapport which he built by conveniently being in public places where he knew Pierce would eventually show up. Over time, Pierce would meet with Romer and basically complain, gripe, and gossip about the inner workings of the outfit. Did Pierce consider himself a confidential informant? Probably not. The Bureau gave him the codename Sporting Goods, and although Pierce would share some information with the Bureau, he still held back a lot of what he knew. In March 1967, Pierce agreed to formally meet with Romer in private in weekly meetings. Pierce refused to answer direct questions, and the answers he did give were, as Romer reported, subject to interpretation, Romer reported that on March 9, 1967, contact was made. It is the normal procedure of this source to evade direct questions put to him, but to be generally responsive when the conversation is directed into general matters of investigative interest in areas where it is known the source is knowledgeable. However, inasmuch as his answers in response to this technique are not specifically responsive to any question asked, the information which he provides is, therefore, subject asked, the information which he provides is therefore subject to interpretation and conclusions by the contacting agent. Mostly Pierce talked about Sam Giancana, whom Pierce had known for decades. When Giancana disappeared into Mexico, Pierce told the FBI that the entire outfit wanted Giancana to stay away forever. The FBI had lost track of Giancana, but they eventually developed intel through the Mexican government which indicated Giancana was living there. Romer asked Pierce to confirm the rumor. After initially denying he knew anything, Pierce admitted to the FBI that they would find Mexico very interesting and that Dominic Blasi and Pat Marcy both kept a watch over Giancana's legitimate business interests in Chicago. After Giancana was killed, Butch Blasi told the FBI that he believed the murder was accomplished by, as he put it, forces outside of organized crime. Pierce, on the other hand, disagreed and said that if Agent Romer knew the truth, he wouldn't believe it and added that Giancana's death was not the result of a power play by young hoods, but rather it was Giancana's refusal to share a highly lucrative source of income with the bosses that led to his murder. Pierce also helped the FBI track the movements of then-boss Gus Alex. Pierce would routinely tell Romer about Alex's meetings in advance so federal agents could stake out the location. He would tell the FBI when Alex was traveling to Europe or staying at his second home in Florida. Pierce also told the Bureau that Alex had three message drops where he could be reached, Selenos Custom Tailors, Apex Amusement Company, and the offices of attorney Maurice Walsh. Pierce outlined Alex's average daily schedule saying that Alex would eat lunch daily at one of his favorite restaurants in Chicago's Loop area. From there he usually went for a swim at the Riviera Health Club, followed by a steam bath and a massage, before taking a nap at the club. He returned home in the early evening. Pierce said Alex didn't like to socialize in the evening because his anxiety and nervous condition left him tired. According to Pierce, Alex was a highly nervous individual who becomes very upset easily and magnifies problems and that by 1968, Alex had suffered a relapse into his highly nervous state and was advised by physicians he was close to another nervous breakdown. Alex had suffered his first nervous breakdown in 1959 and was confined to a rest asylum in Connecticut until he recovered. Pierce ran a policy wheel the numbers game in the black neighborhoods until at least 1968. His wheel's name was Captain Green Dragon Ghost. The names meant nothing. Running the wheel was Melvin Baker, who also worked as a postman. Although as early as 1962, black gangsters had pushed Pierce out of the second and third wards and taken over his wheels there. By 1975, virtually all of the loop and south side rackets that Pierce and James Cachuara had run were taken over by black street gangs. Running his operations in later years was Milk Wagon Joe Whalen, who retired to Florida in 1970 after he was severely beaten by Young Turks in a Southside restaurant. It was reported that earlier in the year, Whalen had used a switchblade to cut up one of the Young Turks who was horning in on Pierce's territory. Whalen was replaced by the much younger Thomas Charles Dart. In 1971, Ross DeMauro was a high-volume bookmaker who also dabbled in real estate received a three-year prison term for criminal contempt of court after refusing to answer questions of a federal grand jury concerning his dealing with Pierce. By 1974, Pierce was mostly retired due to his increasing bad health. Since 1967, Pierce was suffering from near-constant dizzy spells and nausea, as he put it. Sometimes the spells were so bad he couldn't leave the house. Doctors were unable to determine the cause of his condition. He died in 1976 at age 72 of a heart attack five weeks after collapsing.